Welcome to the Middle East Institute. The event today will be live streamed, uh, and we are also recording it uh, to video to be posted on our website afterwards. So please uh, put your mobile phones on silent. Uh, but we do encourage tweeting, and if you are tweeting, please use the uh, handle hashtag MI event. I also encourage you to visit our uh, website. All of our events and, and, and publications are on there. You can sign up to various mailing lists. Uh, we also have our annual conference coming up on November 15. There's a gala dinner on the 14th and a conference on the 15th. Uh, check that out and uh, sign up uh, if, uh, if you're interested in coming. I'm very happy to welcome our guests today, uh, partly because Lina Khatib is an old uh, colleague and friend. Uh, we both used to work at the Carnegie Middle East Center in Beirut. Uh, I was a director until 2013, and after I left, uh, uh, Lina Khatib uh, took over there, so it's a particular pleasure to uh, welcome Lina. Uh, Dr. Khatib is currently head of the Middle East and North Africa program at Chatham House. Uh, prior to moving to the UK, as I mentioned, she was director of the Carnegie Middle East Center in Beirut. And concurrent with her Chatham House duties, Lina maintains affiliations with both Stanford University Center on Democracy, Development, and the Rule of Law, where she used to work before coming to Beirut and Carnegie, and uh, maintains an affiliation at the University of London School of Oriental and African Studies. Lena, welcome. Thank you. Actually, the Stanford affiliation has ended, oh, but dear. they remain okay. good friends. <laughs> Excellent news uh, on the good friends part. Uh, to my left is Tim Eaton, uh, currently a research fellow and previously project manager for Chatham House's Syria and its Neighbors Policy Initiative. So that's the name of it, Syria and its Neighbors Policy Initiative. Before joining Chatham House, uh, Tim was senior projects manager for the Middle East at BBC Media Action, uh, the BBC's international development charity. And to the right uh, of the table, also a friend uh, uh, from Beirut days, Renad Mansour. Uh, is an academy fellow currently at Chatham House and a research fellow at the Cambridge University Security Initiative. His earlier affiliations included the Carnegie, Carnegie Middle East Center, where many of us were, and the Iraq Institute for Strategic Studies, uh, both of those in Beirut. Uh, and he served as an advisor to the Kurdistan Regional Government's Civil Society Ministry. Uh, our guests are from Chatham House, but they told me the Chatham House rule will not apply to today's event, so this is on the record. Uh, uh, we will, our three guests each will uh, make opening presentations. Uh, I think uh, Tim is going first, and then Renad, and then Alina. Take 10 to 12 minutes uh, to present your ideas each. Then I will you know, uh, pose maybe a few questions to our panelists, and then uh, turn it over to the audience for questions and remarks uh, from the audience. And we hope to end promptly at three. Uh, so Tim, uh, the floor is yours. I'll just get some water, please. Water, yes. Thanks. It depends what you say. Uh, okay. More or less, right. uh, okay. Thank you, uh, and thank you everyone for joining today. As uh, Paul mentioned, I'm going to talk a bit about Libya and its war economy. Uh, I don't have a long time to talk, so I'll hopefully just try and spread some of the seeds for the conversation afterwards. But essentially, I'm going to try and do uh, three things. Talk about, first, what I mean by a war economy and why I think it's important in Libya. Second, try and tell you a little bit about how it works and the different modalities that uh, in play at the moment. And then third, uh, give you some ideas of what I think it means for the future of the state. So to kick off then, um, by a war economy, I simply mean an economy in wartime. I don't just mean the parts of an economy that directly contribute to a conflict, although I would argue that many parts of Libya's economy do. I think it's important because it takes us away from you know, quite a simplistic traditional view of war of, against, uh, of unitary actors against each other, of defeat and victory. and looks much more at a kind of mutual enterprise, a battle among fragmented actors and often loose coalitions of, um, of players. I also think it's uh, important to look at because it gives you a window into the developing political economy of the country and I think that helps us understand perhaps where we're headed and the shape of the future of the state to come. So then, how does it work and what do I mean? Essentially, I mean four different types of modalities for, for Libya's war economy. The first, where those have goods to, who have goods to sell. The second, where people, those who are able to derive rents. The third, who are able to, those who are able to predate upon state revenues. And fourth, those who are able to receive uh, revenues from external backers. I'll talk less about external backers, but perhaps that might come up in, 
in the conversation. So those with goods to sell then, this is perhaps what we hear about most in Libya. Obviously, we hear a lot about smuggling, which includes a wide array of activities. It, smuggling's long been a cottage industry in Libya. Um, smuggling of subsidized goods, such as uh, basic foodstuffs, rice, for example, has long been um, important to the economy of the borderlands. But of course, um, even before the revolution, the criminalized trades of, um, of drugs and weapons and other things moving through the country have been important, and particularly since 2013, the movement of people. Um, although I would say in looking at this, it's, it's obviously difficult to come up with numbers how much this trade's worth, but talking to people, having uh, assessing average prices that seem to have been paid and just doing back of the envelope calculations seems to su suggest that the trade's worth around 400 to 500 million dollars a year to uh, Libyan actors. And that um, obviously pales in significance actually to many of the uh, estimates of oil smuggling and fuel smuggling, which, around, which come to around two to 2.5 billion dollars a year. So we're talking about quite significant um, n numbers here. And of course, um, that the ability to take this oil is, is, is problematic because when you actually look at it, this in a political economy, through a political economy lens, it's often the groups that are, are supposed to be protecting that oil that have been implicated in smuggling it, which poses particular problems for the state. A second set of revenues comes off uh, rents. So those who are able to control territory, establish checkpoints, informal movement taxes, for example, and also protection rackets are increasingly important, be that at a bank where that means that bank employees or customers can be extorted, or be that at a state institution where armed groups have been quite effective at getting their guys onto the, the state payroll uh, and as part of ministries. Um, this is a very key form of income for, for armed groups. And then, of course, we have all kinds of uh, extortion. Uh, at a local level, actors with seemingly relatively limited power are able to cause big problems through blockades uh, of oil and gas infrastructure and, and roads. Uh, so this is a, 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 major, a major problem for the Libyan state. Some, some suggest that the oil blockade in the east by Jadran cost the state over $160 billion or so. And then finally, uh, I think a topic which is talked about slightly less in, in the international sphere is, that, is those who are able to predate upon the state's revenues itself. Of course, where I think something like 97% of state revenues come from oil and gas, the ability to predate upon the revenues from those, um, from those activities is, is critical. And in particular, there's a lot of activity which has grown in the last couple of years, particularly from uh, the difference between the official exchange rate of the dollar to the dinar and the black market rate. The official rate stands at something like 1.4, and the black market rate stands at 8. So whoever's able to buy at the official rate and sell at the black market rate can make huge profits. And a number of different schemes and um, fraudulent activities have developed around this, uh, particularly over the uh, uh, obtaining letters of credit, uh, letters of credit obtained for the import of goods into the country. And of course here, where you're able to buy at the official rate and then sell it on the black market, you can make huge profits. And also, it's, it's possible to make, move large amounts of money outside, outside of Libya. So this has become a real problem. Um, it's been reported on by the UN panel of experts and others. For example, one militia um, was able to generate a letter of credit for $20 million without any real um, goods coming in, from the best that I can tell. So this is an increasing pattern of activity. And then, of course, um, when we look more broadly, Libya has the perhaps perverse distinction of being one of the only countries that seems to fuel its own conflict. Everybody is essentially getting paid. Uh, the state payroll remains largely unaudited. Uh, there have been some attempts which have been a bit more successful in the West than the East. But essentially, everybody continues to, to, to draw a salary. And at the same time, the activities that they often undertake are divisive, so the political fragmentation of state institutions, ministries, and other, uh, and other arms of the state is a real problem. We see uh, rival, rival boards, rival governors, rival managers popping up, and that really adds to the administrative chaos in the country. So that's a bit of a run-through then of um, what I think are some of the, the activities that are underway. 
the reason I've kind of chosen to look at these things is I feel that they don't get um, a lot of coverage. Obviously, the migration piece does, but some of the more Libyan uh, dynamics really aren't that well understood. Um, and I would argue that they're really damaging for the future of the state for three reasons. Uh, the first, as you can tell, um, for armed groups, they offer st strong opportunities to sustain revenues and really just continue the, st the status quo. Second, and aligned to that, it perpetuates negative incentives for a lot of these actors and the entrepreneurs, if you like, of, of Libya's war economy. Um, these, are the, these are actors that have little incentive or little to gain from a political process which restores central governance and a functioning security sector. So it really leaves quite powerful spoilers. And in particular, many of the actors in these sectors um, aren't part of any of the political processes. So they really remain outside the tent. And, and lastly, and I think it's, we, we shouldn't be too um, comfortable in looking at, at the, the functioning of Libya's uh, bureaucracies. There are three uh, state institutions which I think everybody agrees have to run for Libya to um, continue to function the National Oil Company, the Central Bank, and the Libyan Investment Authority. But the administrative chaos that pervades the LIA and other, other state institutions really is worsening, and there's a crisis of legitimacy, there's a real crisis of, um, lines of lines of command, and with the economic problems that Libya faces, really many of these arms of the state are reduced um, to uh, little activity, if at all. And so what I think um, the threat in some is, is that a lot of these actors, these armed groups or weak actors on the periphery continue to sustain their activities through things that harm the state. But they need the state to continue to function to be able to draw money from it. The danger is, is that they miscalculate and predate so much that they precipitate a cycle of state failure. Um, I won't talk about um, potential policies to counter it. I'm sure we'll get to it in the, um, in the discussion, but for now, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tim. Yeah, definitely that raises uh, very many interesting points we'll come back to in Q&A, including uh, what are the policy implications and how to impact it. Uh, Renan, let's go to you. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, so I'll be looking at the case of Iraq, uh, another uh, case where you have this sort of collapse of the unitary state and from that the emergence of uh, these type of economies uh, that, that kind of proliferate. Um, I, I suppose what I'll do is I'll take the theoretical frame that Tim has outlined and see whether it fits and where it doesn't fit because ideally what we're trying to do here is understand a theoretical thing which is the war economy and its impact on state building and its impact on peace and, and stabilization and seeing whether we can actually extrapolate some commonalities. Because if you speak to Iraqis, for example, they would say that Iraq is a has been historically a stronger state than Libya, so you shouldn't be comparing Iraq to Libya. Um, but in any case, these countries face the same kind of problems. So why is it important? We find that, you know, how to defeat ISIS. The first solution, the easiest solution, is to bomb them through a military option, and that's been done. And when almost the entire international community is on the same side, fighting a few thousand Salafi jihadis, um, you know, that, that, that it took a while in Mosul also, but it's largely done. The next step then comes to the political solution, which as we're seeing today is already very difficult, with all sides already beginning to bicker against each other in Iraq. There's another step after that that we've never ever even got close to, which is understanding the economic part of things, understanding the smuggling routes and, 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 and the opportunities and incentives that really drive these actors, particularly in areas um, where you do have groups like ISIS emerging. And the fundamental assumption that we have here is yes, a lot of the senior leadership of the, the so-called Islamic State of Daesh were ideological and pursued, pursued ideologies, but most of the organization in Iraq at least were opportunists who found a better opportunity with a different group. Most of them easily will turn back to anyone who's paying, and we've seen that in the past in Iraq itself. You know, David Petraeus' idea wasn't only to bring extra U.S. troops to Iraq in 2008, 9, 10, but it was to start paying the tribes, start paying the Sunnis to bring them back. And that was ultimately the fundamental uh, carrot that brought everyone back to the state, was we will give you jobs. See, fundamentally, they understood that, that was really important. And yet, when we talk about what's coming in post-ISIS Iraq, the conversation is still about, you know, we need to bomb them, and, we, and the focus is on bombing them. 
but the roots, as understood by Iraqis and many analysts, is not in bombing them because they'll reappear two, two, three years later in these cycles, right? So you have cycles of state building and state collapse in Iraq. And at the moment, we're, we're at a point where the cycle of rebuilding the state. So it's good to be addressing these issues, we believe, now and understanding how we can kind of perhaps avoid, in a very optimistic way, um, the, the, the reemergence of state destruction. So one of the challenges, however, in Iraq and in this kind of ideas, we always kind of think of things as state, right? There's a blurred line between what is a state actor and what is a non-state actor in Iraq. And I think it's the same in many other cases. For example, al-Hajj al-Shaabi, okay? 60 or so uh, paramilitaries, militias, right? Many of them emerged after 2014. Seven of them existed before are officially recognized by the Iraqi state as a legitimate entity according to a parliamentary law in November 2016. What is more, the Prime Minister's office has been giving them $1.5 billion each year. Now that money isn't going to individuals who are fighting, but to Abu Mahdi al-Muhandis, who is the administrator. Okay. Now then, Abu Mahdi al-Muhandis acts away from the state, apart from the state. He's not a state actor as such. He has many of these different militias and paramilitaries kind of compete against the state at times. So you see there's a blurred line there, recognized by the state, but not necessarily into the state. There's a war economy element to this as well, of course, because much of this money, I mean, some of it, of course, will go to the fighters, but a lot of this will go to creating institutions, uh, giving money to martyrs, giving money to communities in a way to win votes. And what we're seeing is some of these paramilitaries have political campaigns as well. The Better Organization, for example, has 22 or so seats in parliament. And in the upcoming elections in Iraq, they're going to be competing for, you know, many of these paramilitaries will be competing for votes by using the state's resources, which is one of the conditions that Tim set out as part of the, the war economy. Uh, so, you know, the, so what happens then is, firstly, we need to understand kind of this differentiation between state and non-state. Another reason why we think the war economy is important is it necessarily makes us focus on the local, which I think is oftentimes uh, ignored when we look at Iraq as a whole. Looking at war economies means looking at who's powerful, who's influential in different parts of the region. It's not necessarily the central government. The way these countries are moving forward, the local is becoming much more important to look at than the central. That's not to say the central government is, is no longer there, but power is diffused, power is divided, and the war economies, I think, kind of exemplify that more than anything, and that's why we think it's important to look at, to look at that. The third thing I want to do is look at ISIS. Sort of, there's been a lot done on you know Daesh financing, how they got their money. I'm sure many of us in here are familiar with those. You know, in terms of the first condition, goods, trading goods, uh, selling, buying goods. We've seen this, right? Everything from trying to use oil, even though the oil was more uh, uh, of a transit to antiquities to you know trading cig cigarettes and everything we've seen. Second thing, taxation, rents, licensing fees. When they did try to build a state, any business had to have uh, licenses. Any businesses had to be part of that. The third is the, the kind of using of state resources. And this is where the war economy blurs. If you look, and, and we have, you know, we've seen documents of what was happening in Mosul, right? Legitimate political parties and state actors were part of that economy from Iraq. You had political parties, and I'm not, I'm not all of them, Kurd, Arab, Turk, engaging with this war economy. This economy, these smuggling routes, is part of every level, from the international to the, to the, to the regional to the locals, right? So like a, a legit, and I'm once, I don't want to say names, there are specifics that we know, but like for example, a company that's associated to a political party would provide the telecommunication networks for the Islamic State while their fighters were fighting against the Islamic State, right? So it's, again, it's an important element to understand, uh, and, and I think that that's why we think uh, we should move forward. In any case, uh, what's sort of the future of what's happening to the Islamic State? And I'll end with this because I do think there is a difference. Many people consider it to be the world's richest terrorist organization. I mean, they did accumulate a lot of cash in the last two or three years by taking over banks, but also by gaining donations and taking over a smuggling route. The smuggling route, by the way, which has existed since the 1990s, at least when there was oil for food and when Saddam Hussein decided that as a state actor, he had to use non-state resources to, to, get, you know, to, to sell oil and gas because of the embargoes. So those routes have continued to exist 
throughout the years. It's just ISIS was the most recent iteration of group that would control those lands. Um, but anyway, it's, you know, with the loss of territory, they've had to change their economic resource, uh, sort of financial models, with an anticipation that looking at what's happening in Iraq today, they're making the bet that there's going to be no political solution, there's going to be no socioeconomic solution, we'll be back, let's, divert, let's invest our money. So what you're seeing is investment into legitimate in industries. You go around Baghdad, you go around many of the cities in Iraq, through middlemen, they're paying middlemen off to buy hotels, clinics, uh, pharmaceuticals, and their favorite, which are currency exchanges, right? So there's been a decision that all the dinars, the Iraqi dinars that they, they've accumulated, to switch them to dollars and be able to use them elsewhere, if that is the case. And part of this, by the way, also included taking advantage of the Central Bank of Iraq, right? So the Central Bank of Iraq had currency auctions, and Daesh were able to get in, into them and, and, and change using state actors. And that's the final point, which is the weakness of the state. What's being done by the Iraqi state to combat these kind of terrorist financing? Well, the problem is, on the file of, uh, of, of, of counter-terrorist financing and anti-money laundering, you have the Central Bank working on it, you have the Ministry of Interior working on it, you have the Counter-Terrorist Service working on it, you have the Ministry of Finance working on it, you have the Prime Minister's Office working on it, you have the Hajj Shabi working on it, and you have the Ministry of Foreign Affairs working on it, but not any of, more, any of them working together. Right? And, and you have the English, so the Brits working on it, you have the Americans working on it, but at the end of the day, the weakness of the state allows these economies to proliferate. The question I always asked many when I was doing my field work was, if everyone knows that that's a company, if everyone knows that this is happening, why isn't, it being, why isn't anything being done to address it? And fundamentally, the capacity isn't there to address it. But in any case, I think it is important to continue focusing not just on the politics and security, but also on the economic aspects of these wars. Thank you, Renat. Thank you very much. Lina? Thank you very much, and it's a great pleasure to be here and to um, especially be hosted by uh, dear Paul. Um, I'm going to talk about Syria. Uh, I've been working on Syria for a number of years now, and now at Chatham House I'm leading a project called Syria from Within. Uh, the project looks at internal dynamics on the ground in Syria, um, because everybody seems to be focused uh, for the most part on international relations when it comes to the conflict and on refugees and also on counterterrorism, but comparatively there is little attention to what is happening on the ground. And the war economy is one of the things that are happening on the ground um, in Syria. Uh, right now, of course, when you say war economy and Syria, a lot of people are already starting to talk about reconstruction. Uh, as being, you know, um, the next kind of big issue uh, and perhaps something that might provide the West in, in particular with a bit of leverage, um, supposedly. Um, so I thought I would just give you a bit of an overview about different dynamics as they relate to the war economy in Syria and different Syrian regions. Uh, starting with um, areas uh, uh, where we see a significant presence for the Hayat Tahrir Sham, mainly in Idlib. What's interesting there is that Hayat al Tahrir Sham, which uh, has um, relied to a large uh, degree on foreign donations, is now following uh, a model similar to what Renat described in the case of ISIS in Iraq, in the sense that it is also starting to uh, buy and set up private companies. And this is a way for uh, Al Hayat to try to sustain itself financially without being too dependent on funding from the outside. And the other thing that it has done is that it, it has taken control of electricity and water provision in Idlib. This is not because it wants to provide services, but it want, because it wants to charge citizens for the provision of these services. And of course, being in charge of electricity and water gives it a large degree of control over the population um, in Idlib. And this um, has been one of the reasons why um, uh, groups that want to tackle Hayat Tahrir Sham are concerned um, about uh, the potential for cutting off water and electricity supplies in the governorate um, were they to be kind of uh, damaged uh, as collateral damage in any attack. Um, having said that, uh, these dynamics by Hayat Tahrir Sham are by no means the, the predominant dynamics in, in re uh, rebel-held areas. One thing that is uh, ongoing is actually trade between regime areas and non-regime areas. And when we think about this kind of trade, of course it is happening through all kinds of middle, middlemen 
And this means that goods that are passing in either direction need to pass through a number of checkpoints and people need to pay taxes to the various people controlling the checkpoints. And this means that there is vested interest on both sides by the groups who are benefiting from this economic arrangement to keep the status quo as it is. So this is another uh, complication uh, that we face when thinking about ways to um, end uh, this conflict. Uh, I'll move from rebel areas quickly to besieged areas because they have a bit of a different uh, dynamic going on. Uh, these are the areas that the regime basically is encircling, such as in Ghouta. Of course, we have heard about tunnels uh, that are being uh, dug up or that have already been dug up and are fully functional, um, uh, such as in Ghouta, through which uh, different groups, uh, uh, again, pass goods uh, you know, from food to equipment, etc. Uh, of course, just as I was describing when it comes to Idlib, uh, the same situation applies in the sense that there are middlemen who broker uh, the smuggling of goods and who again benefit from the status quo of the siege. Um, but what the regime is doing uh, as well is that it is manipulating the exchange rate inside and outside uh, besieged areas so that uh, the exchange rate in besieged areas for the dollar, for example, is a lot higher than uh, the exchange rate outside. So not only does the regime benefit from uh, besieging these areas, um, it also benefits from basically extorting money in this indirect way through uh, manipulating exchange rates. When it comes to regime areas, and this is where I would like to spend most of, most of my time uh, speaking today, because it is um, a bit less covered than what I described, which are regime areas and besieged areas. In regime areas, the situation is actually more complicated than uh, what many might think. A lot of people assume that because the regime has maintained control over those areas, that they haven't really changed, uh, that uh, the regime uh, economic dynamics basically remain as as they were before 2011 when the uprising started in Syria. But that is actually not the case. Uh, if you think about the state budget in Syria today, it has gone down from $18 billion before the uprising to only $4 billion. Um, and half of this money right now comes from external sources. Um, it is due to these external donors that the Syrian regime is basically able to stay afloat um, economically. Inflation, meanwhile, in Syria has risen 700% since 2011. Um, and this status quo is uh, uh, basically being exploited by a number of people. It is being exploited by Iran. It is being exploited by pro-Iranian militias that operate uh, in regime areas. And it is, of course, being manipulated by uh, business people who are loyal to the regime. Um, so what the regime is doing in order to uh, kind of stay afloat and particularly avoid sanctions is that it is setting up private companies um, and at the same time it is partnering with companies outside Syria such as companies in Lebanon. So even if more sanctions are imposed on the regime, there are always uh, regime loyalists who will be willing to set up private companies um, in their names or, 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 or you know, somebody else's name uh, in order to kind of uh, keep uh, uh, business transactions with the regime um, going. Um, the other thing that is uh, uh, happening is that uh, these uh, kinds of individuals are starting to become very active in the construction sector. So for example, in December 2015, something called the Syrian Council for Metal and Steel was set up. And it was heavily populated by individuals who are uh, basically very close to the regime. So engaging in these kinds of uh, uh, initiatives to do with the construction field is a way not just for the regime loyalists to benefit from any forthcoming uh, contracts regarding reconstruction in Syria, but it is also um, uh, a way for them to take advantage of the current destruction in Syria. So we've had cases in which uh, after the destruction of certain areas uh, uh, you know, that used to be controlled by rebels, uh, some of these new construction company um, uh, operatives would just 
move in and remove rubble and steel and take them uh, to be recycled in plants set up um, by uh, these particular business people behind these companies. So just like I was describing in the case of besieged areas with the double benefit, you know, for the regime, you could say the same thing about the destruction uh, that is being um, imposed um, on these uh, types of areas. Uh, the other thing that uh, uh, is happening economically is, of course, and you've heard about this, uh, the different contracts that are being drawn up between the Syrian government and Iran. Uh, these tend to be focused on uh, certain fields such as agriculture, tele telecommunications, and phosphate mining. Phosphate mining being very important for Iran because of the nuclear byproduct that, uh, you know, that comes up when you mine phosphates. Um, but interestingly enough, within the Syrian uh, government, not everybody is as enthusiastic about these contracts, and therefore right now we are seeing delays regarding implementation of these contracts. And this is mainly to do with internal um, competitions and some sensitivities regarding um, Iranian influence within various uh, Syrian ministries, especially by those who are more kind of loyal to the, to the Russian side. Having said that, um, right now, Russia and Iran are more uh, kind of uh, harmonious than non-harmonious uh, in, uh, in Syria, but the situation may change um, in the future. Russia is also today presenting itself as the main broker for reconstruction in Syria. So you are seeing various entities from Syria and outside visit Moscow and try to court Russia because they want to position themselves um, uh, kind of at the forefront when the time comes for the distribution of uh, reconstruction aid. So Russia is not interested in paying for reconstruction in Syria. It is actually interested in benefiting from reconstruction and uh, using Russian companies um, uh, and the Russian state as, as brokers. Uh, Iran, on the other hand, is likely to be paying, but it is uh, planning a, a, a rather uh, you know, clever way of uh, getting its money back. And uh, we are seeing one manifestation of this through the Iranian keenness on fighting in Deir ez-Zor against ISIS. Of course, we know that the Deir ez-Zor region is where the oil uh, uh, fields uh, are in, uh, in Syria. So if Iran gets its hands on uh, energy fields in Syria, then this would allow it to become self-funding when it comes to its own activities uh, inside Syria. And, of course, it will use this to consolidate its presence throughout Syria, including paying for some of the pro-Iranian militias that currently operate alongside the regime. Now, when it comes to these militias, um, of course, just like we have seen in, in rebel-held areas, some of these uh, militias have uh, resulted in the creation of warlords who uh, control certain neighborhoods um, and uh, uh, kind of are operating as a parallel structure to the state. But at the same time, the Syrian state is accommodating the presence of these militias because the militias have also set up uh, civilian, uh, between quotation marks, organizations like charities in which they uh, also try to get funding for themselves through Syrian state institutions, such as through the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Um, and of course, we have to remember that the Syrian Ministry of Foreign Affairs continues to receive funding from external sources and international sources. So in a way, this international money flows to the ministry, and then the ministry gives the money to the various charities set up by the militias. So in the end, the militias kind of get their funding in that way. And this is you know, a way for the regime to keep the militias happy. And the militias, in turn, set up the charities in order to deliver to the communities in their regions and keep them happy. Um, so as you can see, what we're seeing here is a situation in which the status quo becomes preferable to a settlement when you look at it from the perspective of these non-state actors um, kind of operating on the ground, which we should think about for the future um, as potential spoilers um, for any settlement deals. Um, and I will just end with a note on the issue of reconstruction. Um, a lot of people are assuming that reconstruction in Syria will be a case of uh, finding some form of settlement and then the regime perhaps uh, uh, staying in power at least for a period of time and then funds would come in and be deployed to reconstruct destroyed areas in Syria. But the Syrian regime is actually not interested in reconstruction 
reconstructing the whole of Syria, it is only interested in getting support for loyalist areas. So uh, Aleppo and Homs, for example, are not really a priority. And the same would apply to the issue of refugees. Uh, the regime is not keen for the refugees that are currently outside Syria to come back to Syria, partly because it is easier for the regime that has now reduced capacity to govern areas if they are largely empty of their original residents, and partly because the regime wants to punish those areas whose residents rose against it by not um, allowing them to have much access to reconstruction funds and keeping them empty of their citizens. But crucially, the regime also can use the refugees that are outside um, Syria as a tool to negotiate with the West um, when needed. So there are many reasons why the Syrian regime itself is also benefiting um, economically and otherwise from the situation of refugees. There's a lot to say, so I will stop here and thank you very much. Thank you, Lena. That's a fascinating, very rich presentation and set of pre presentations indeed. Uh, let me ask a few general questions to the three of you and answer separately. I mean, one is maybe a collective question. Um, I understand currently maybe these are separate research projects, but my question is, what have we learned from other civil wars, uh, you know, in other parts? Uh, what, is, what does the literature say on challenges of transitioning from war economies through peacemaking, through post-conflict? What are the lessons learned there, and how might that apply to these various countries? Uh, a second question is, uh, how do you differentiate between sort of a war economy and an, and an economy during war? And maybe, you know, in other words, in my sense, maybe the war economy, things that are fueling conflict or make money off the conflict. People smuggling arms, certain monopolies. Uh, that's one dynamic. And the other is, well, it's a country that's lost its central government, and they need to get food, and they need to get electricity. So an economy evolves during wartime. And my question there is to really, um, among this world of you know, war economy, what, 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 uh, what uh, practices or things are fueling war and are really forces against resolving it and which are just economic patterns that one, one has to take into account. Uh, and that might get to thinking about sort of settlement and post-settlement that during, during these long civil wars and collapse of central authority, you have a new political economy emerging some of them are warlords, but others are economic entrepreneurs of a new kind, uh, certainly decentralization of economic life. And effectively, the country is transformed in terms of its political economy from the old elites to new elites. Uh, my question, how does that seem to be playing out in Libya or Iraq and Syria, and how much of it might be something that could be part of a settlement, and how much is really an antipathetic uh, to a settlement. Uh, and the third level of questioning is from the ongoing negotiations, at least in the Libyan and Iraqi case, there's very little happening on the Syrian case, how much has have issues of economics gotten into, you know, Ghassan Salami's new initiative and so on, and the meetings relating to Libya? Uh, how much is it part of the uh, Iraqi I know there, you know, there's concern about Putin. Now there's the referendum. Now there's Kirkuk. But how much in the politics is taking account of these economic uh, realities? Uh, and I'll end with a very specific question, which might only apply to Syria, and that's about the drug industry. That often the the huge game changer in civil wars is when global drug, you know, cartels or industry moves into a civil war country. That was the case in Lebanon, Afghanistan, Colombia. I haven't heard that that's, maybe there's some smuggling through Libya, but I haven't heard that it's a major issue in Libya or Iraq. But I'm hearing more that there is perhaps a problem of that as well, because that often just becomes something you can't, you can't move against. So uh, some reflections in the same order perhaps, Tim? Want to go first? Okay. A series of tough questions there. <laughs> um, yeah. So, what have we learned? Let me get this closer to okay, you. Sure. So, what have we learned from transitions of? Or have there been successful transitions from war economies to peace economies? Uh, Lena's probably better place to talk on Lebanon, but generally, in, in scouring the literature on this, 
there's not a whole lot of success on which to draw. Um, and and in, in particular, um, it seems to draw, often boil down to fairly a simple dichotomy between integrating or, or attacking these interests. And um, I really feel that there's a need for much more work here. A Part of the reason for our interest in, in this topic and war economies in particular is that much of the, the previous literature has been upon uh, Somalia, uh, West Africa, East Africa, and Afghanistan. And we found that the rentier nature of Middle Eastern and North, Middle Eastern North Africa states has got a clear difference. This necessity for the state to function at a certain level to distribute revenues um, is important. But of course, it also um, has, a, has a strong history these states have a strong history of rentierism. I guess to draw the parallel here and pull some of these bits together, um, perhaps a good example at the moment in Libya is what's happening in Sabrata, um, a western coastal city, uh, a focal point of, of human smuggling. And clearly when we're talking about tackling war economy or however we wish to define it, the, the, the nefarious or negative impacts of these economic actions, then it comes down to realigning incentives. And in some cases, what we've seen, because of political imperatives, particularly from European states and Italy in, 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 in particular, you know, trying to pay off groups to not do something and incorporate them in the state. But what I think we've learned from this, particularly in Libya, is where some of these groups have been integrated, but they've managed to retain their autonomy and their chain of command. And effectively, this just means that they get paid twice. You haven't removed, um, you haven't put any barrier to the, in many ways, doing many of the things that they were doing before. And that incentivizes them to continue to do those things. So I think, um, to borrow Lena's line, the problem is all these peripheral actors that find the status quo preferable to a settlement. And mm -hmm. I think in Libya, that's, that's a, a major problem. So if we fast forward to Hassan Salame's action plan, which makes a lot of sense on the theoretical level, it's going to be really tough. You know, how do you get all of these fragmented actors to, degree, to agree on representatives in blocks which don't really exist as blocks? Who are the three people going to be on the presidency council? What chance will you have of agreeing that if you couldn't agree nine? And if you're in a certain town, say the Sabratans or in Zawiya, uh, elsewhere, you're not going to get one of those three, and how do you retain your interest, and I think there's a decentralization, a collapse of state authority element to this, which is really important in that in some ways, these groups are very powerful, but only locally. There are very few national actors which really conditions their approach. And I think that their economic interests at the local level are imperative that aren't really being addressed, I feel, in current um, international efforts. Uh, they, a lot of these guys, as I, as I mentioned, re remain outside of all of the tracks, and I see them really as, a, as major spoilers um, mm -hmm. down the line. Thank you, Tim. Edinard? Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, it is, I mean, as, as Tim says, there's not that many successful case studies of, of transitions. I mean, the Kurdistan region tried it. Um, 1990s, they were fighting a war against each other, and they decided uh, to come to United in 1998, an agreement, and started to transform the war economy into the KRG. But what we really, really saw was the we a weak institutionalization so that political parties and those same kind of lords uh, created a parallel state or were still benefiting. So it is very challenging, both in the literature and also in the, these, the re this region as well, particularly, as Tim said, because of the rentier mm -hmm. um, effect. I think, and, and, and Iraq, you saw this too. I mean. It, when people talk about sectarianism in Iraq and this and that, it was the problem really was an economic problem because each side had a ministry. Sunni Shia, and you know this from Lebanon mm -hmm. too, Paul, Sunni Shia, Kurd, they, the elite all became rich and the people didn't. And so the challenges we're seeing these days is a realization of that. Um, so moving forward, that process where, I mean, what you're having transition from war economy to peace economy is the elite just creating a system that they benefit from. And when they can't, not using the institutions, but using extra institutional me mechanisms to maintain power and wealth. And ultimately, I think we also have a problem with the definition of what war is, kind of old and new wars, mm -hmm. right? I mean, is, is Iraq still at war? 
today. I mean, is ISIS, I mean, when, when did the Iraq war end? When did which war begin? So I think, you know, and, and then a question of intervention. Does embargoes, do sanctions count as intervention? So because of that, we, we find ourselves having an issue um, with what actually war economy is, because as you say, it sounds like it could either be people benefiting from war or people fueling war, and I think those are good questions. Um, finally, when you look at war economy, people either tend to focus specifically on the groups. So like, what do the groups want, what motivates them, and this is a lot of war economy literature on that. Or, and, and what's happening, for example, the LSE today is, is looking at sort of the political markets, uh, the economic marketplace, um, which is a political marketplace, sorry, which is looking more of a systemic structural level. But there hasn't been much done on kind of the interaction between the two, between specifically looking at agents and looking at the structure that facilitates those, those agents. Um, fundamentally, because what we see in many of these contexts is you, there's chaos, right? You have these people fighting these people, but as all of our presentations have shown, on the ground, it's business as usual, right? And that business as usual continues. Uh, so, I mean, these are all bigger kind of questions. Um, on the point of the question of sort of the political settlement, as I mentioned, um, there have been people who have realized that a political settlement is ultimately and has to be an economic incentive. You want IDPs to return, what will they return to? Right? There needs to be economic incentives, there needs to be job sort of creation, reconstruction, but however, the problem is the current system we have for political economic settlements is to give a bunch of cash to the elite, right? And the international community continue to rely on the same elite. So stabilization is happening, reconstruction is happening, but no research is being done on who the actors are, right? In Iraq, since 2003, the international community is still dealing with the same leaders, the same cast, you know, just you know, what used to be prime minister, now vice president, used to be finance minister, now foreign minister, same people. And these people have lost a lot of legitimacy. On the ground, for example, in, in recently liber liberated areas, you have Sunnis saying, please don't give reconstruction money to my sheikh, right? Because we know we'll never see this money. So this is, I think, fundamentally the bigger problem happening in Iraq with the political settlement. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Nina. Um, you asked about uh, the new kind of economic uh, actors who emerge in the context of war. This is definitely happening in Syria uh, because a lot of the business people who are against the regime left Syria as a result of the conflict. And in their place, there has been a new wave of new businessmen um, who have, uh, uh, as I said, started setting up uh, factories and opening businesses and uh, other private companies. But generally speaking, in Syria, we are still seeing the same old economic elites who also happen to be political elites, such as the Makhlouf uh, family. Um, Rami Makhlouf, as a lot of you may already know, doesn't just own all kinds of businesses, including uh, the telecommunications uh, uh, network in, uh, in Syria, but has also set up a so-called NGO called Al Bustan, that has a, uh, a militia branch as well. So an NGO with a militia branch. Yes, it's it's Al Bustan. It's supposed to be um, an, an an NGO, <laughs> but it also has a militia branch. This is why nothing is black and white in the context of a of a conflict like Syria. So um, so what we're seeing is these political economic elites are are benefiting from the the status quo right now almost as much as they benefited from the neoliberal uh, economic policies uh, that Assad has, had implemented in the past. And they are positioning themselves to benefit from whatever new uh, kind of <laughs> economic arrangement happens in Syria um, in the future. Um, but the spoilers kind of come from, for example, the militias. Uh, if you think about it today in Syria, the pro-regime militias pay higher salaries than those paid by the Syrian army. And therefore, um, and also, of course, offer more flexibility, you know, in terms of um, their everyday terms. Um, so it will become quite difficult to convince the people who have joined these militias if a settlement to the conflict is reached um, to join, for example, the Syrian army as an alternative. So you need to offer them economic incentives that would be attractive enough. Um, the final thing I will say is that the uh, kind of key difference between the cases of uh, Iraq and Libya on the one hand and Syria on the other hand when it comes to the situation right now and how to solve uh, the war economy uh, problem is that in Iraq and Libya uh, we are thinking of a framework of restoring state authority. 
Whereas in the context of Syria, we are not talking about restoring state authority because of all the problems that have to do with the Syrian regime basically equating itself with the Syrian state. Um, and therefore, uh, uh, what is needed in Syria is the creation of a new uh, uh, state system. And this is not something that, that can happen you know, um, easily at all. Um, so we're, we're really dealing with a very uh, complex situation in Syria that I think is, is far uh, worse to deal with than the situation in either Libya or Iraq. Any comment on the drug issue? Oh, sorry, yes, um, the drug issue. Um, well, as we know, uh, in uh, uh, Syria right now, one of the key uh, militias uh, operating on the ground is Hezbollah. And Hezbollah already has its uh, drug cartels that are operating internationally, not just in Lebanon. And uh, Hezbollah and its uh, uh, allies inside Syria have uh, been linked to uh, uh, the sales of drugs like Captagon, uh, interestingly enough, to ISIS, amongst others. Um, so again, sometimes uh, the, uh, looking at the drug uh, kind of uh, dealing uh, dynamics show you that some groups may well be fighting uh, in battlefields, but may well have um, economic activities behind the scenes, just like the Syrian regime used to, you know, buy oil from ISIS just as it was talking about ISIS as an enemy. Um, drugs have been a major source of income uh, for Hezbollah uh, in Lebanon, and it is a similar case uh, in Syria. If anything, Syria just expands the market and expands uh, the extent in which it can engage um, in this kind of activity. And other groups, you know, are, are involved in, 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 in a similar kind of um, uh, process. So... Yes, it is sadly rampant. <coughs> Thank you, Lina. Let's turn to the audience. There's a microphone, Robe. Why doesn't the microphone come to the front so we can, uh, let's take uh, Bill in the third row and then we'll come to others. Bill, keep your hand up so you can, there you go. Introduce yourself. And uh, Bill Lawrence, uh, George Washington <coughs> University. Um, hi, Lina. Hi. Um, the, uh, my question is, uh, uh, a little bit like Paul's, but going in a slightly different direction. Um, all of these economies pre-war had huge informal economies on the order of 30 to 60 percent of the economy and 40 to 70 percent or more, depending on, you get down to the Sahel of, uh, of labor. And so in part, you're, when you're talking about solving a war economy, well, let me make a second point. When you, there's a pre, a during, and a post. I think the wartime economies, Paul asked the right questions, but then there's a post economy as well. And then the three countries are hugely similar. I mean, you can take this blurb you wrote for each country, and each of the lines on the blurb on this, this sheet here could apply to any of the three countries. You know? So there, there are huge similarities of problems here, but then at the same time, there's massively different political economies in each country. And you got into a little bit talking about rent here, but yeah, I mean, in, these are three different chapters in Kamet, Richards, and Waterbury, you know. So, so thinking about solutions, my question is, how much do you just have to look at the literature of formalizing informal economies and bringing labor into new systems of exchange and alluding to your quick comment about neoliberalism and all that, right? Um, and, 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 and also how much of the post-conflict Reconciliation has to be a post-conflict economic reconciliation. And don't you have to kind of build three different models for the three different countries because of the natures of the economies? That's, that's my question. Thank you. But make notes of the questions. We'll take a few. Uh, the gentleman in the front row. Hi, my name is Gabriel. I'm a student at American University. Um, this is a question for all three of you. Mr. Eaton, at the beginning you spoke about black markets. How significant are unrec how significant is unrecorded economic activity? Um, is it detrimental to the to the economies? And what are the governments of Libya, Iraq, and Syria doing in response? Thank you, uh, gentlemen in the sixth row or something like that. <coughs> Hi, Hamidilou, uh, Middle East and uh, Sahel region analyst. Uh, my question is for Tim. And a quick comment before the question is regarding letter of credit. You didn't elaborate. Uh, isn't it a, um, a money that companies get from central bank 
when they get a bill from overseas. So let's say they are billed $10 million for goods. They will ask their client overseas to bill them 14, 15 million, and they will share or take that difference. And this type of um, trafficking in currency, in money, cannot be done without the complicity of foreign companies, whether in Europe, United States, or wherever. So my question, have you investigated those companies who do business with Libya and actually are complicit with them? Thank and you. legitimate companies, actually. Tough question. Uh, 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 this lady in the fourth row, keep your hand up so the microphone comes to you. Thank you. I'm Bethany Allen Ibrahimian. I'm a journalist with Foreign Policy Magazine. Uh, I'm interested in uh, drug routes and how they might have changed, so, you know, supply routes um, for drug smuggling in Iraq and Syria, um, particularly uh, Captagon. Have there been any changes in the past year? Um, you know, originally this drug was produced and, and smuggled out of Bulgaria. Uh, and then, you know, the routes changed um, and it was, you know, w within Iraq and Syria it became very prevalent. But that seems to have maybe uh, is kind of going back to Bulgaria in the past year. Do you know anything about that? Thank you. Let's go to our panel and go in reverse order maybe. Lena? Uh, yeah. Um, I will tackle your question, uh, Bill. Good to see you. Um, the issue is the three countries, even <coughs> though they may look similar, require distinct solutions because it's not one size fits all. When it comes to Syria, uh, economic destitution played a key role in why the conflict happened in the first place, especially if you look at an area like the East, which is rich in oil, um, and in which residents didn't really benefit from the natural resources in their areas, and there were grievances as a result. Um, so I think the way forward for, for Syria is to have a decentralized model of governance that includes a degree of economic decentralization as well, so that the residents of each particular region can, first of all, feel a bit of a sense of ownership over um, uh, the economic uh, conditions in their regions, and at the same time, get a bit of benefit from the resources that are present in, in their areas. Um, there is also a lot of uh, sensitivity around the issue of the, the strong central state, uh, because it was exploited by the current regime in Syria. So it's, it's also needed, if only as a measure of trust building um, in, uh, in Syrian society. Uh, the third reason why decentralization, I think, should be thought of is because already the model of governance in Syria has significantly changed um, after 2011 with the setting up of local councils. And, and this has changed expectations of people at the local level. Um, so instead of just removing um, uh, these, um, I will call them experiments in democracy, I think we can build on them instead and use them as a resource uh, to reform uh, governance across Syria, which would, of course, include um, economic governance, rather than you know, restore things to kind of the pre-2011 uh, model. Um, in terms of the drugs routes, I haven't, to be honest, looked in that degree of detail regarding where the routes you know, are, are, are going right now. All I can say is things um, are likely to get very interesting if Iran gets its hands on the Deir uh, uh, eastern kind of region, um, because this will only facilitate uh, certain routes um, for, uh, for its proxies inside Syria. Thank you, Arunad. Thanks. Um, yeah, it seems to me that it's, it's all part of a process rather than there's a pre, a during, and then a post. And, and to me, this is also all about institutionalization of, of the economy and everything, right? Um, so for example, you could have peace, but not have the institutionalization of the economy. I think the Kurdistan region kind of showed that to some extent, not the, institution, the institutionalization of security and of economics wasn't there, and even political parties, to be honest. So it's all a process. You have the, you know, you have the immediate end of, of war, and that's why I kind of challenged this definition of what is war in the war economy. And then you have peace, and then you have post. Uh, but it's, you know, the question then, and it's always the last thing. 
you know, first it's security, then it's politics, then it's let's deal with the econ economics. How do we incentivize people to come back? So, you know, in Iraq, the pre would have probably been the 1990s, where, you know, as I said, Saddam Hussein decided that to create, to establish smuggling networks to be able to get rid of, you know, sell oil and gas. And also he was unable to control parts of this country at that point as well in the Kurdistan region and elsewhere. Um, so yeah, and, and the post would definitely have to be eco economic institutionalization, which is very difficult. The Prime Minister Abadi has a lot of econo economists working inside him. One of some of his, in his posts, and some of his top advisors are economists. So he's definitely focusing on it, the reform package that he's trying. But he faces a lot of structures when you have NGOs and economic groups with militias and 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 that, and 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 just finally, um, on on this whole idea of legitimate companies. I've had, you know, oil companies approach me and say, there's this company. You know, when you do due diligence, a lot of times when you're doing due diligence work, you're seeing that there are legitimate companies that are interacting in the global markets that are, you know, are, are companies that have affiliations with some of these groups that are terrorist organizations as defined by, um, you know, some Western countries. So it's a huge problem, and it will be continue to be a problem as we try and identify who actors are in Iraq. On the drug trade, um, Captagon, uh, I, yeah, I think it was an issue, uh, but it's, it, has, it wasn't as, as in, in the last few, I mean, I haven't heard much about it in the last about six or eight months in Iraq, um, but I'm not, for, you know, the, the drug trade is something even further down than what we're talking about, which is more of the, the smuggling routes of other things. Thanks, Renard. Tim? Uh, Gabriel, the black market, it's very strong. I remember uh, needing to draw up money in 2013, 2014, going, being entirely unable at the bank, turning up at a, a currency trader and seeing notes stacked, yay high. Um, I was in and out in two minutes, I got a receipt. It was the most efficient service I ever got in, in Libya. The banks did not work in that way. Um, and I think particularly what we've got to bear in mind is that around 2014, the exchange rate was relatively similar. So we've gone from 2014 with like a small margin on the black market to now the fourfold uh, increase that, that we have. So for many people, the black market is just the market. Uh, back to some of Paul's points about coping, people still have to survive. If you can't get your money out of the bank, a big problem is liquidity in Libya. So even, you're not able to withdraw all of your salary from the bank. People are, are wary of banks as a flashpoint of conflict. They're often controlled by militias. So it leaves them with very unenviable choices. And when you add to that the cash culture that Libyans have and lack of trust in those kinds of institutions, then you can see that the black market is always going to be healthy. But some of the other problems that have arisen um, in the attempts to tackle um, some of the black marketization is, say, the reduction in the number of letters of credit and some fiscal policies, which have meant that fewer letters of credit are available for fewer products. This means that, say, if you're in construction, you can't get an LC for um, your business. So what else are you going to do? You either stop building or you, um, or you, um, or you, pay, pay the, or you, just, you just pay the price on the, on the black market. So um, I think there, and there's, a, there's a broad acceptance of, of, of that informality. And a lot, I've been doing quite a lot of work trying to understand the extent to which the black market can be controlled and manipulated. I think that's a a, a big debate, but certainly there are some traders that have made a lot of money very, very quickly, and these guys don't have much incentive to see the banking sector resurge. Um, directly um, on the letters of credit, my understanding is thus. Um, say, for example, you get a letter of credit for a million dollars to import water. That does, at the end of the day, have to be signed off by the governor of the central bank, Sadiq al-Kabir. Um, what often happens is the company that is dealt with overseas is a shell company or kind of somewhat fraudulent. Uh, there have been a number of examples of these pointed out by the UN panel of experts and the Audit Bureau of Libya. Um, so say, for example, um, I only end up buying $400,000 of water. That leaves me $600,000 outside the country. If it's a shell company, I just redirect it, either bring it back in and make a profit or or keep the money outside the country, which is, I think, increasingly the case. Then when it comes to the customs officials, you pay the price to make them actually say that it is a million dollars worth of product. Uh, and then when it comes in, you're still selling at a fourfold increase anyway, if, if you wished. I think it, one of the interesting things about some of the LC scams is that inflation would be much higher, by my reckoning, if um, people were only making money through the sale of the goods in the end, because they've made so many margins elsewhere, 
they don't actually need to make the whole black market rate. They just push it up um, as, um, as, as they see fit. And I think one of the things that one of my colleagues has been looking at um, in Yemen is the CPI index. And you would think in conflict-ridden countries that you would have huge variations of, of, um, of consumer prices. But actually, they're relatively stable. And you realize some of the data that's coming out of the NGOs now, there are discrepancies. And sure, a place like Derna is more expensive. You'd expect that with a kind of a pseudo siege. Um, but actually, they're relatively similar. So there's this, there is a degree of stability to this economic system. And people, I think, understand the extent to which they can um, they can make profits. Thank you, Tim. Another round of questions. Lady in the fourth row. Hi, um, my name is Shabnam. I'm with the Syria Justice and Accountability Center. Um, a lot of the discussion about uh, about sales has been on goods, but in terms of uh, real property, uh, you know, there's. Uh, forced sales that happen of, 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 of property and fraudulent transfers. And I'm just wondering how prevalent is that in the different contexts? And um, if it is prevalent, I, I mean, it's a big issue for, for property restitution return. Um, and, uh, and if it's fueling, fueling uh, the wartime economy, uh, uh, it could be a big obstacle to address. So what, how do you see that being addressed um, in the post-conflict period? Thank you. Gentleman right to your right, next to you. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Sebastian. I'm a student at SAIS. And I have actually two short questions. Uh, one is on the role of the private sector in a post-war um, area, like taking Lebanon as a blueprint um, of a failed or successful transition. I don't know. Um, we see in Lebanon like a very strong private sector that is even stronger than the states in many respects. Like, for instance, the generator mafia controls for uh, large parts of the electricity supply. And today we see the same things happening in Syria, in Aleppo, for instance, with generators popping up. So my question is, how do you think will this evolve in the future? Will these countries follow the same path as Lebanon followed? Um, the second question relates to what uh, Mr. Mansour said about the role of uh, money going, international money going to elites who then do not distribute this money, but rather use it for their own um, ends. And so my question is, um, there's a lot of work being done on the impact of corruption on extremism. And um, what do you think can be done like, to avoid this, um, this spiral of, um, of conflict in terms of how can we surpass corrupt elites and get the money directly to the people on the ground? Like, I mean, the EU has, so, has spent so much money on the, on the PLO and so much money has been pumped into the PLO and it has never reached the Palestinians. And we have seen the developments with like, ISIS getting stronger and stronger. Like, how can we avoid like, such a situation in Iraq or Libya or um, Syria? Thank you. Uh, gentleman in the fourth row right here. Uh, keep your hand up, sir, so the microphone can find you. There we go. Uh, Dan Liebman. Yes? Yeah, I'm a writer. Uh, yeah, uh, I wish you would elaborate on the statement that uh, the Syrian Assad is not helping the areas that were not favorable to him in reconstruction, like Aleppo. Because what I've read in the Western press, uh, Assad did pay the salaries of the teachers in Aleppo and is now paying the salaries of the, of the workers in the electrical industry in Idlib. And after, uh, I think it was in Homa, the uh, rebellion, within one year they reconstructed the destroyed part of the city. And I was recently talking to someone who was of Syrian descent, seems to know somewhat about Syria, and he claimed that Aleppo was almost completely rebuilt. I think that may be an exaggeration, but uh, he indicated that there was quite a bit of reconstruction there. Anybody from the right wing of the room? Lady in the far back. Hi, uh, hi. Oh, hi. My name is Jennifer Chang. I'm with USIP. I was wondering if, if um, anyone on the panelists could talk about Yemen's wartime economy and kind of the dynamics and the actors behind that. Thank you. On Yemen, if anybody has a question. A repeat uh, question over here. Hi. My question is from, for Ms. Lina, please. Uh, you made very serious charges against uh, Hezbollah and that local NGO with regard to uh, uh, drug trafficking and militias. Do you have any evidence? And if so, can you share? Thank you. 
Okay, thank you. The gentleman in the second row. Hi, um, I have a, as maybe a comparison with Afghanistan and their reconstruction yeah. efforts. Your name, please. Uh, I'm Nolan. I'm with the Heritage Foundation. Uh, but with Afghanistan and its reconstruction efforts and its uh, state rebuilding, is there any successes in Afghanistan that uh, can be pulled from to implement in any of these three regions? Thank you. Uh, let's go back to our panel. Renaud, start with you and go right to left. Okay. Um, I'll address the question that was kind of focused, uh, asked to me. It's a very difficult question. You know, this is the question that all everyone is asking. Um, it's, it's a consequence of the cash economy, right? You give a bunch of cash to someone um, in that transaction, a lump sum, and say, we want you to build this. Uh, they'll build it, you know, if, if they say it's 20 million, they'll use 5 million to build it, and, and the rest uh, will be given amongst each other. That's what we've seen. So it's probably one way to combat is to go against that. There needs to be a better sort of management and, and oversight of, of where money is going to, um, which would probably mean the employment of Iraqis from, like if we're talking about reconstruction of these areas, you have IDPs who don't have jobs. I mean, there, I mean, there is an, a, a chance to give jobs um, and, and pay directly to employees uh, who, who could help rebuild and reconstruct, but obviously these are heavily traumatized populations where stability and security is still precarious. So it's a very difficult question, but fundamentally, how do you beat corruption? You know, you can try and institutionalize it, so at least it seems uh, not, not, not as obvious amongst personalities, but actually in institutions, but it's a question that many you know, countries around the world face. Uh, but it has to deal with first understanding who are legitimate actors, because the other thing is when, when an international actor decides to deal with one person, they are legitimizing that person from the top down, right? Um, and that's hurting bottom-up processes that are, that are emerging. Huge protest movements in Iraq uh, at the moment. You have Shias protesting against their Shia leadership and Kurds against their own Kurdish leadership and Sunnis as well. So there is this movement towards issues being important. Um, and the key here will be to try and understand that movement and to see how, you, how that can be better supported. Um, I think that was the only question that I had. Well, I had many. Uh, I'm going to start with the question on drugs. There are many, many, many published studies and reports. All you have to do is really just, just Google Hezbollah and drugs and you'll find quite a few. Uh, one of the uh, latest reports is actually from here in the US from the Drug uh, Enforcement Administration. Uh, this was last year when there was an operation led by the US with the cooperation of uh, some European countries mainly to disrupt uh, Hezbollah's uh, networks that were cooperating with drug cartels in South America in order to uh, basically launder money um, to fund um, Hezbollah activities in, uh, in Syria and Lebanon. So just look up the um, Drug Enforcement Administration, Hezbollah, and, 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 and you will see the extent of, uh, of the report and the operation. Um, when it comes to property in Syria, uh, there has been recognition that uh, with war comes an opportunity to uh, acquire uh, property uh, basically illegally, yet getting away with it because of the lack of documentation. So what we have seen is two things. Hayat al Tahrir al-Sham has got its hands on uh, land registry units uh, in some areas uh, in Idlib. While at the same time, there have been reports that the regime has burned down uh, uh, documentation uh, regarding uh, property ownership in areas in the south. And there is now a civil society initiative in Syria to try to dig digitize as much as possible uh, uh, basically land registry documents because uh, uh, people are be finding it increasingly difficult to prove that they own uh, certain properties uh, when they return, especially if they are IDPs or, or, or refugees. So the issue of property is, is, a, is a very important one. And the other thing that is happening, which probably not a lot of people know about, uh, is that in Damascus, in uh, areas that are considered um, uh, you know, uh, wealthy, such as Mezze, the regime is using the narrative of reconstruction as an excuse to raise down certain buildings and rebuild uh, uh, kind of or, or replace them with uh, luxury apartments, such as the project called Mezze 66. Um, and therefore, you know, everybody seems to be, um, you know, trying to use uh, uh, the conflict in order to um, get their hands on, on property or lucrative uh, land. 
Uh, when it comes to the issue of uh, paying salaries, actually the regime has for the most part continued to pay salaries across Syria, even in rebel controlled areas. And this is because the regime regards salary paying as a way of having leverage uh, over people. And it's also a way for the regime to continue to show people that it has authority even in areas that it does not have military control over. So it is a very political move and it is not done out of goodwill. Um, when it comes to Aleppo having been rebuilt, uh, I definitely don't think so. Uh, Western Aleppo has had a lot less damage. Perhaps some of the images you might have seen are of uh, Western Aleppo, but Eastern Aleppo uh, has had significant damage. And uh, you know, no, it has not been rebuilt um, uh, uh, at all. Uh, the final question I have was about the private sector growing. Um, well, I think in, in many ways it is inevitable uh, in Syria uh, that we are going to see uh, a further move uh, uh, towards uh, the, the private sector simply because the state capacity has, has lessened and because of the dynamics of the conflict that mean people now both in regime and non-regime areas have different expectations from the state and therefore, uh, the, and also the private economy as I was saying is a way um, in which the regime can avoid sanctions, etc., etc. So it makes sense to kind of uh, use that uh, channel as opposed to try to, you know, centralize everything under a state umbrella. But that doesn't mean that this wealth will be shared. So there's a difference between growth in the private economy and shared wealth. Uh, when the same uh, political economic elites continue to run the show in Syria, all this growth is, is still going to be pocketed by them, just as we had before the revolution. Thanks. Thank you, Lina. Any last uh, questions from the audience? Gentlemen in the second row. Yes, my uh, question to Mr. Mansour. Uh, actually, for your Iraq, name, name uh, my name is Mohammed Al Saidi from Saif. Uh, for Iraq, uh, don't you think that it's time to consider Iraq's economy as a in a in a phase of post-conflict economy? like where we need to address the uh, structural uh, factors such as uh, corruption, the weak institutions, and the marriage between the politics and the uh, economy, the crony capitalism that even led and contributed to the uh, emergence of ISIS in, uh, in many areas. And the other uh, one regarding the comparison between uh, Libya and Iraq, um, I think I, I see the state's strength is uh, in Iraq is more evident than uh, than Libya, and the extent to which it can, uh, you know, uh, have access and make changes. Uh, I think it's it's quite different. No offense to other our uh, Libyan brothers, but you know, uh, I see it. Different. No offense taken. No, thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, lady there and the gentleman here. Lady. <coughs> Hi, Amanda Britt, private consulting for GCC States. Pardon my allergy voice. Um, what role do you see youth under 30, 35 playing, particularly in these countries in the black market economy um, and or the legitimate economies? And what efforts are being made and what potential do they have in helping rebuild post-war economies, if you will? Thank you. Gentlemen in the first row and then the third. Thank you. Once, name, once again, my name is Gabriel. Um, one of the most important things for economic development and economic growth in countries following conflict is the diversification of their economies. What are some of the emerging industries that you guys see in Iraq, Syria, and Libya, and what are the, their respective governments doing to encourage the growth of these industries? Thank you. Behind you. Hi, my name is also Gabriel. I work, I'm an intern here at the Middle East Institute. Um, you have all spoken to some degree about how internal revenues to the state have created these war economies and fueled the conflicts. I was wondering if you could each speak more about how foreign revenues in each conflict are, are fueling um, the conflicts. I'm specifically thinking with regards to arms and ammunition smuggling. Thank you. Okay, that'll be the last round. Do not embellish my... Let's go. <clears throat> Uh, yeah, as, as I said at the beginning, um, when you compare Libya to Iraq, Iraq has a much stronger legacy of, uh, of statehood and the state, and I'm not saying that just as an Iraqi, but as someone who, re who, who looks, looks, at, looks at these conflicts. Again, 
this has been, I think our discussion has proven that the term war economy needs to be problematized and complicated, definitely. This time last year, Iraq, you know, the second largest city and, and a lot of Iraqi territory was occupied by um, Daesh. So whether we're in post-war, I mean, we're on, the, we're on the way there. And in fact, issues like corruption and things I think should, should be beginning to be addressed during the war as well. Um, not just leaving to the end, because what we've seen time and time again is you leave those issues, you deal with the political issues, and then you try and deal those, and you get back into war. So it's, I, again, I think it's all a process. Um, I, but I definitely think that uh, the issue of corruption is very important. If you ask most Iraqis today what were the roots of ISIS and what led to ISIS, they won't say sectarianism, but what they'll say is corruption. Um, so it, it is a big issue, and, and as I've said in my talk, um, it, you know, it's, it's something that they're realizing. And if you, the one of the only things that all Iraqi leaders will agree is that they're all corrupt. Um, so the, the sort of the age of denial is over. They all say, yeah, well, there's corruption, but the problem is now corruption itself is being politicized, right? So corrupt people are, are, are impeaching other corrupt people, right? And it's becoming a political tool. And we see that as problematic as well. Um, and again, this is part of institutionalization. Uh, the question about diversification, uh, I mean, these are rentier economies. It's so much easier when, when, when you have all these international oil companies coming and signing big contracts and saying, we'll give you this cash. It's, 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 it's been tried in, you know, in countries that don't have a third of their territory occupied. Uh, but there are, I mean, there are economists in Iraq who are trying to work on how to diversify. Obviously, tourism isn't uh, something they're looking at at the moment, but they're looking at agriculture and other kinds of industries like that. Um, and just reconstruction and rebuilding might be an industry uh, that, they, that they would be looking at. And finally, the youth, yeah, these countries, the youth is the majority of the population. Uh, if the state doesn't represent them with opportunities for employment, they do look elsewhere, and the black market is an option. Thank you, Renatina. Yeah, I mean, I would say the same dynamic that Re Renat has described regarding uh, the black market applies to Syria. Um, there are, uh, there's already an infrastructure for the informal economy, and it is likely to continue if the wealth is not shared, which is what I was talking about uh, before, which simply means that we're not, you know, solving the problem at all. When it comes to arms smuggling and arms dealing, I mean, you know, in all the conflicts that we are talking about, the arms dealers, you know, are benefiting quite a bit and they benefit from the continuation of the status quo um, at the same time. That's it. Thank you, Lena. Tim? On the international um, sides of this, I'll give you two examples. Um, the first being a state actor. The UAE has been documented by the UN panel of experts as admitting that it's circumnavigating the UN arms embargo on Libya. It has provided, um, has provided vehicles, and it's, it's also pretty clear that weaponry is coming via Moldova from, from other places. So that clearly impacts on the calculations of an actor such as Haftar to come to the table when and when not to negotiate. But I think perhaps a, a more interesting um, uh, point for, for this discussion is to go back to the stuff in Sabrata, where um, Renad talked about ecosystems earlier. Um, this idea that you can just pay the group at the top of a chain off and then stop the whole economic system of incentives that lies underneath it, I think, is, is highly flawed. Um, and in fact, if you were to look at the political economy of, of migrant smuggling in Libya, you would realize, I think, that it's a supplementary income for most places and most groups on the, on the coast, but it's the lifeblood for many groups in the south. Yet most of the efforts to stop it have come on the coast. There hasn't been much done to um, diversify, to develop alternative livelihoods, to provide better, um, to be better options for those in the south. Let's not forget many of them don't have citizenship in Libya. They don't have access to the state's largesse. And while there are oil installations in the south, they don't tend to work in them. So they don't really get many of the benefits. And when you just look at the economic system of the Sahel and and southern Libya, you realize that you need to move high value goods to make a profit. So you've got to just deal with those market forces. And I think this is where the in international policy would be better focused to, to understand and reverse these incentives by dealing with drivers rather than just uh, perpetuating rentierism. Because at the end of the day, what happened in Sabrata was after two months, another group started to fight. And there are different narratives around this, but essentially, 
there were um, 3,000 people displaced, 300 buildings destroyed, and the city of Sabrata is a mess uh, for, in, in a way. There's all kinds of political fallout from paying off that one group. And we, there are many different theories about how they were paid off. But that, I think, is the wrong way. And also, I just feel that where there are opportunities for better policy to minimize opportunities to predate upon the state, for example, the black market rate, there has to be a, a better discussion in Libya about reducing the official exchange rate. And the central bank at the moment says that it needs political, um, political progress before it can do that and put together a, a package of uh, reforms. But as Renad says, this is kind of you know, indicative of the fact that the economics often comes last, but the situation's moving too fast and the damage is getting great. So I think it does um, need to be m pushed much further up the agenda. Thank you. I want to uh, thank our Chatham House colleagues for coming here today, uh, Tim, uh, Lina, and Renad, and for working on a, you know, digging deeper in these uh, conflict situations going beyond what everybody usually focuses on, security and politics, and uh, unearthing all these uh, additional layers of complexity. Uh, I, I've learned a lot. Uh, it's been a very rich set of presentations. So please uh, join me in thanking our panelists.